All right, so so thanks everyone. Uh, so introduced earlier, I didn't speak with uh, with Pat, but I'm Vernon Weisberg. I'm a principal program manager in uh, Azure Government Engineering, um, and tonight we're honored to have a couple of guests here to talk. Uh, Angel Smith, who is a director in our Azure Government Affairs, um, and then Dave Mahelchik, if I got that right, um, a principal consultant for DMMI and a former CTO at DISA. Um, and I'm just going to allow them to take a, a you know, a few seconds to introduce themselves, and then we'll just jump right into this. So, so hi, I'm Dave Mahelsik. Uh, as uh, Vernon mentioned, I'm the uh, former CTO for the Defense Information Systems Agency, and um, I guess uh, I just would like to preface all of this by saying my biggest regret and failure of my federal service was my inability to help the DoD move to the cloud. And uh, you know, we, our journey to the cloud I actually started back in the year. 2006, if you can believe that, where we tried to take DoD applications and move them to EC2, which was really the one commercial cloud service offering at the time. And, uh, you know, um, I think there was a period of time, and there's a guy over there named Brock Webb who worked for me at DISA, and now he's uh, off doing bigger and better things. But uh, we wrote a uh, computing strategy for our director on average about once a month, but we could never get anything to stick. So uh, uh, I, I'm still tilting at that windmill but now sort of as uh, just a private citizen. I'm not working for Microsoft nor any other cloud or computing provider. So, uh, you know, these are my opinions and no one else's. Uh, so my name is Angel Smith. Um, I am uh, working, as Vern said, on the uh, Azure Government Affairs team. Um, before I came over to Microsoft last year, I was working on the, the notorious House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. I was there for a few years, and prior to that, I spent uh, 23 years flying the sexiest airplane in the Marine Corps inventory, the C-130 Harvest Hawk gunship, our, uh, our uh, Hercules Airborne Weapons Kit, which is a super sweet, swanky airplane. Um, and uh, I'm spent, the, while I was on the Intelligence Committee, we spent a great deal of time trying to uh, encourage industry to work more closely with the DOD uh, because there was a pretty significant aversion from Silicon Valley to work with the Department of Defense. As you can see, that, that, uh, that problem seems to has been oh. That, that problem seems to have uh, perpetuated a little bit to, even to this day, but uh, I decided it was time to go ahead and move over to the industry side and see if I could possibly get DOD to listen from the opposite end of the spectrum. So thank you very much for having me. So great. We'll just jump right into it here. Um, and usually I let ladies go first, but I'm going to pick on DISA for a second. Um, former so, DISA. Yeah, former DISA. Uh, so first question for you, Dave. So what do you see as the key aspects of the recently released duty cloud strategy that will help maintain our military strategic advantage um, and as a follow-up to that what if any elements would you have added to it so um, it's concise uh, that's for sure it's 11 pages and four pages of appendix uh, quite frankly you can probably save yourself the time and just go right to those four pages um, unfortunately uh, there there are some things in it that uh, are uh, um, certainly good uh, with respect to uh, security and resiliency but unfortunately, it, it seems more like an attempt to justify a particular acquisition strategy that the, uh, the DOD has put forth uh, through the JEDI effort than really an attempt to put forward a cloud strategy for the department. So, um, you know, I, I could go into much greater detail on that, but perhaps uh, we can drill down on that with subsequent questions. Thanks. Angel? Um, <clears throat> I completely agree with David. It's, it is uh, suspicious that the cloud strategy actually came out after the RFP was released, which is, you know, you typically would come up with the strategy first and then uh, do the acquisition later, but whatever. Um, I would say that one of the things I think that it is missing out of the clou cloud strategy right now is the fact that the acquisition strategy that the DOD currently utilizes, there's no mention of that inside the cloud strategy and your whatever acquisition vehicles that they're currently using outside of OTAs, it, there's, there's no way to um, implement any AI or ML or anything that would be a successful association with cloud and based off of the current acquisition strategy that the DOD utilizes. So that would have been nice to, for them to address that. Uh, you know, the, the other, I think one of the biggest um, um, misses is that it doesn't really focus, it's not warfighter centric, right? What a warfighter wants is they want to get access to the information they need to execute their mission, and, and you as a, as a warfighter know this, and you need tools to be able to help you effectively use that data to accomplish your mission. And unfortunately, um, the cloud strategy isn't really, uh, doesn't come from those warfighter terms. 
Um, the, the other big failing is it fails to recognize history. So DOD has actually a, a long history and a lot of investment that have gone into trying to modernize their information architecture. Uh, the, uh, the DII COE, the Defense Information Stru Information Infrastructure Common Operating Environment, the Global Information Grid, um, the uh, Net Centric Enterprise Services, uh, the, uh, uh, the DOD data strategies. So all of these things, and uh, you know, hundreds of millions, perhaps billions invested in these prior initiatives really failed to move the needle. And I think part of uh, what the strategy needs to do is look back and say, what have we done before and why weren't those effective? Okay. So with that sort of as a context, then what do you see has been actually driving the cloud migration for DOD to date if we're saying that we really aren't looking at a warfighter-centric uh, approach here, then what is the driving strategy behind this? Um, well, despite the fact that David's probably been working on cloud integration, he started working on it in 2006. Um, I, I Unsuccessfully, would, though. <laughs> yeah. I would argue that actually the catalyst for what got this ball really rolling came out of, I don't know how familiar you, any of you are with the algorithmic cross-functional, uh, um, the algorithmic warfare cross-functional team that was started by um, uh, Bob Work um, and led by Lieutenant General Shanahan and uh, Colonel Chris Kukor over at the Pentagon. That was a, also called Project Maven. That was an initiative that the DOD was putting forward because they realized that analysts were being completely and totally overwhelmed by mountains and mountains of data that they could, know, they could, uh, they could not analyze. So one of the first projects that they did was they took an attempt at trying to uh, use some AI and ML to get at some of the um, unmanned aircraft uh, full motion videos that were coming in that the analysts were spending, you know, thousands and thousands of hours of, t uh, of trying to just kind of watch videos and, and come up with some type of, of uh, analytics of these things. So what they realized very quickly was despite the fact that the AI and the ML would be very helpful in it, if they were going to take it to scale, they were going to have to come up with a, some type of a cloud strategy or cloud implementation. Otherwise, this wasn't going to be very helpful at all. So that happened uh, back in 2017, and that was really, in my opinion, uh, the, the catalyst that kind of got this whole ball, ball rolling when it came to cloud. The interesting aspect of it is, despite the fact that they started with Full Mission Video as their first um, kind of initiative, there has seemed to be a little bit of a flood taking place inside the DOD when they realize that understanding that intelligence and analytics was probably the first uh, first focus on it, they're realizing now that um, to not think about logistics, to not think about predictive maintenance, to not think about uh, all the other things that go along with all the other warfighting functions, it, it, the cloud brings a, um, a force multiplier to all of these activities all the way down to the independent mission level. And so now it's starting to be a little bit of a domino effect whenever you start talking about cloud inside the DOD. Uh, so, you know, from my point of view, once again, we were working with cloud technologies in the middle 2000s. We ported DoD applications over to EC2. We had one particularly uh, stellar demo where uh, uh, my uh, uh, senior 15 engineer running the project uh, flipped a quarter on the table in front of an Army two-star general and said, ma'am, I'm going to pay for this demo out of my own pocket, and then proceeded to show her all sorts of DoD command and control applications running in Amazon EC2. And we made some initial progress, but unfortunately, culture is uh, probably the biggest nemesis of uh, you know any progress in the Department of Defense. And culture in the Department of Defense uh, really uh, resisted any particular change. Um, you know, we uh, had a similar problem with the DoD network in the early 2000s. Uh, we were using uh, strange legacy protocols, uh, something called ATM, which is not a way to get cash, uh, you know, for your weekend uh, jaunt, but really was a, uh, a legacy networking technology that the DoD had bought into. And it, it was only the forcing function in 9-11 that uh, caused us to uh, uh, not only get funding, but get the leadership support to make a quantum leap forward in terms of the DoD network. And uh, really, we lack that. So there has been some incremental progress. And, uh, you know, in uh, 2008, we did some great work for the Vice Chairman and the Joint Chiefs of Staff to be able to integrate uh, disparate information sources together and make better decisions on, you know, everything from, uh, you know, missile defense to uh, air defense of the Washington's airspace um, and uh, leveraged uh, platform technologies to make that happen more quickly. But one once again, uh, you know, when that particular leader uh, left the uh, military service, um, we then saw the uh, the powers that be sort of line up behind to moving back to the old way of doing business. So 
you know, despite that, there has been incremental progress. Uh, you know, one of the things I like to point to is there's a, a project the Air Force has called Kessel Run that uh, was originally focused on just automating uh, tanker refueling calculations and mission planning, and now they're, they're moving into other areas. But uh, they are based, uh, they do their development in the cloud. Uh, they have a virtualized environment that supports the application, and they use a commercial platform capability to, uh, to speed their time to development. And they're able to get software into the warfighter's hands in weeks um, instead of months. Uh, a major DOD application, I would say a typical release time is about once every six months. Uh, you know, you compare that to how often you're dropping capability to Azure, uh, you're probably 26,000 times uh, faster in Azure than the uh, DOD C2 system. So you mentioned culture um, sort of as a, as a blocker and a challenge to overcome. What are some other uh, potential challenges and obstacles to overcome for cloud adoption across DOD? Um, combining disparate data sources from the millions and millions of siloed, um, siloed information sections within the DOD. Everybody believes that the information that they have inside their own internal little network is the most important and the sexiest piece of information and nobody else can see it and trying to convince everybody that uh, all, all the different uh, agencies and little departments inside the DOD that they need to uh, stop siloing all of their information. I think overclassification of information is also a problem uh, whenever you start to look at especially long-term cloud strategies. Um, and then also there is a, um, I, I'd, I would argue that there's a generation gap that's also the leadership inside the DOD is, uh, it's led by a generation of individuals that didn't grow up in a tech heavy culture. And so they're still looking in a lot of ways, you've got people that are still looking at cloud, uh, the, the cloud as a less secure uh, vehicle for for data storage. They're, they're, they really do believe that their on-prem storage is a better way and a more secure way to take care of their data. And um, so now take that outside of the DOD and then multiply that times all the different government agencies that are out there. And then you realize that it is an all of government problem. This is um, sometimes seems insurmountable, but you know, just as the SBA gentleman was talking about, I mean, you, you got to hope that at least some point there's going to be kind of a, a, the floodgates will open and it'll just kind of all start happening. And maybe the DOD a transition Jedi in 82 days, it'll be you know, a miracle. So I, I agree with you that uh, that data visibility and sharing is probably the biggest problem in the department. Cloud doesn't necessarily fix that out of the box. Cloud can be an enabler, uh, but really you have to look at data ownership, who owns that data, uh, and you got to move from a need to know to a right to know uh, approach. And once again, this is something we uh, made some progress with in the late uh, 2000s, um, and we saw a leadership change, and we went suddenly from uh, leadership in the Pentagon that said, you have to share your data to all of a sudden do whatever you want with your data. So I think the cloud can help with that problem, but just moving to the cloud doesn't necessarily solve anything. And in fact, that may be the biggest issue uh, the DOD needs to grapple with right up front, what problems they're trying to solve a lot of the discussion seems to focus around, we want to close a bunch of legacy data centers, so we're just going to forklift 20-year-old uh, applications into the cloud. And quite frankly, that should not be the first challenge. The first challenge should be how to modernize development techniques, take advantage of the cloud to be able to much more cost-effectively and rapidly develop and deploy applications into the warfighter's hands. You know, that's, that stuff that's kind of running well today, Leave that alone for now because you don't have the money to uh, accomplish that forklifting today. Instead, focus on the next problem, like, for example, your uh, uh, analysis of uh, full motion video, a great next generation problem. You know, don't worry about that uh, clunky old ERP system that's running COBOL on a mainframe. Yeah, you, you know, you bring up a, um, a really good point. When we talk about data, I, I honestly think probably a lot of this, the momentum is going to come from intelligence analysis because you've got the greatest pulsing for um, opening up data sets coming from inside, I don't want to say the intelligence community, but at least within the military intelligence community because the one thing about intelligence is it's only good if it's discoverable, if once you get it, it's timely and it's actionable and it creates some type of actionable intelligence. If you can't uh, have those items, then it you know it becomes just interesting information after that. So um, there's been a pretty significant push, at least within the intelligence circles, to try to open up those data sources so that way your warfighters, when they're you know no kidding, under the gun and they've got to make a really really intelligent decision, they can do it with the most information possible and make very you know very educated, smarter decisions that will 
arguably reduce loss of life and just help you know help make better decisions on the battlefield. But once again, just moving to the cloud doesn't solve that problem. You can have silos in the cloud just like you can have silos in your legacy data center. You have to purposefully set about solving that problem. And the cloud can help you with that, but only if you purposefully set about solving that problem. So uh, talking about Jedi um, and some of the uh, industry comments and, and publicity around it, um, there's been debate between different sort of camps on Jedi as to whether Jedi should have been a multi-cloud strategy versus a single cloud strategy. Um, so what are your thoughts on multi-cloud versus single cloud for Jedi and so, for DoD? You know, I, and without necessarily going into the, the morass of what's going on with Jedi right now, I, I think multi-cloud is the only strategy for the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense is the largest IT customer in the world. It's an incredibly diverse environment. There is no central control. The DOD CIO doesn't control budgets, doesn't give direction. They provide oversight and governance. Even the service CIOs don't control the programs and the funding. They're, they're down at low levels. Colonels with major programs executing their strategies. So um, you're going to have to have diversity. What the DOD should be shooting for is to have a diverse toolkit of both uh, legacy, uh, virtualized and bare metal services, uh, uh, private clouds, uh, public clouds provided by uh, the various uh, providers depending on their particular um, uh, specialty. Um, and then PEOs and programs should select the cloud that best meets their needs, and we should ensure data sharing as we do uh, uh, new application development. But once again, that doesn't necessarily force us onto a single platform to accomplish that data sharing. It requires us to expose the data, to label the data, and come up with access control policies so um, you, know, uh, you can access it based on your need, not necessarily just based on the fact that you're in my command as opposed to a different command. I totally agree with everything David says. I'm a, a huge advocate of creating a targeting problem for whatever our adversaries are, and single cloud just makes it easy for whoever's trying to tap into our, our, our networks. And, and you know, to, to be you know even more blunt about this, um, and, and uh, you know, not trying to cast stones at uh, the the good work that's been done in DoD cloud, but Jedi uh, is going to be a 10-year contract, even though it's only two base years, uh, it, it'll be in place for 10 years. And if history tells us anything, at a minimum, it would take DOD two years to transition off of it. The reality is if the DOD truly does move 80% of their processing onto one single cloud environment, they'll never get off of it. Um, it, it you know, they're, they're basically locking themselves into a trap. Ideally, what they should be looking at is to come up with a multi-cloud strategy that uh, arbitrages various cloud providers. They can use uh, processing and storage based on lowest cost and best fit to mission need and have infrastructures in place to be able to seamlessly move applications and data between those infrastructures as mission requirements change and as uh, uh, business drivers change, like uh, one provider dramatically lowers their prices. Um, so for the audience here, and then at, this will be my last sort of moderator question and we'll open up to the audience. Um, how can those of us in the private sector uh, become better partners to support the DOD um, and government all up in their journey to the cloud? Oh, so one of the things that I, I feel like I see on, on the Microsoft end anyway is I would love to see Microsoft as a company work more closely with individual mission users to better understand what their actual problems are and try to come to the table with engineering solutions that fit specific uh, problems. Right now, it, it seems like we're still kind of in a little bit of a transition period trying to make sure that we can actually sell, uh, sell solutions to specific issues. And uh, I think it, the DOD, I think, is also growing in that area. They're, they're learning how to ask those questions, and we're learning how to provide it. So if we could just kind of continue to progress down that one, I think we're going to be a much better, uh, uh, much better partner when it comes to cloud services. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, understanding the, the warfighter mission requirement and helping them understand how cloud technology can solve problems that they could not solve before. Um, and focusing on those, once again, rather than forklifting some broken old application that's running just fine inside a legacy data center. You'll get to that eventually, but focus on those real warfighter problems. Uh, saving lives, uh, you know, making the military more effective in executing their mission. And um, the other thing would be education. Educating uh, from the senior leadership on down to the uh, information technology uh, system administrators 
what cloud is and how it can help with their mission. And quite frankly, I, w I was kind of disappointed in some comments I recently saw out of DOD CIO that essentially said, we really can't make any progress until uh, all of these Jedi um, uh, um, court cases get resolved and we can award that contract. The fact of the matter is the DOD could make huge progress now, uh, investing in training, um, investing in updating their testing and security policies and procedures to be able to uh, adopt technologies and approaches like continuous integration and continuous deployment. So I instead of saying we're going to sit here and wait until we can award this contract, DOD should be focusing on these. And I think uh, commercial industry can help DOD with some of these problems. You know, quite frankly, um, you know, uh, in my spare time recently, I've been taking all the free training I can on technologies like Azure and technologies like uh, AWS, technologies like Red Hat. Uh, it's fantastic. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, government system administrators and security professionals would really benefit from a well-rounded cloud education. Yeah, you know, just, I, I don't mean to, you know, dovetail off of what you're saying, but one of the things that I've actually been surprised by since I've been working at Microsoft is how little we do going out and reaching out to the, to the government and letting them know all of the unique and interesting technologies that we actually have available. Um, I'll be honest with you, most of the time, the Department of Defense has no idea what's in the realm of possible. They really have no idea. They don't get it. They don't understand. And so we get cold calls all the time when they're saying, hey, you know, I've got this exquisite or this unique problem. Do you guys have anything that would, you know, solve this? And uh, it's, it's mind-boggling to me that w I think we should, we've got to be better advocates of the innovation that we, and this is just, just not just Microsoft, it's any tech company, be better advocates of the type of technology that you have and push that over to the Department of Defense because in the end, their success will, whether the DOD is successful or not in defending this nation, will you know, have a direct representation of whether or not we're going to continue to operate in, in the freedoms that we have right now. So I'd say push it. If you got good stuff, throw it out there and, and give them demos. All right, thanks. Going to open it up to the audience for questions. Dave, can is this revenge because I asked you a question? No, it's not. Dave, Dave and I go way back, so no, it's not Dave. Um, no, you, you said something about need to know versus right to know, and that sort of intrigues me. I think need to know is sort of old school, I guess you're suggesting. And then yeah, so absolutely. Uh, in the Department of Defense, even though we have a classification system and a clearance system, uh, even with the uh, clearance matching, matching the classification, you still have to assert your need to know. And uh, speaking of video imagery, I remember, you know, in the early 2000s when we first started putting uh, streaming imagery online, the only way to get access to it is you had to call down to McDill and talk to some E5 and explain to them, you know, why I need access to this information. And then they would go and, uh, you know, uh, uh, twiddle some bits on a server and you could finally get access to uh, streaming imagery. And, and, you know, that was one of those things that astounded me. And, and along the way, we, we tried to uh, field various approaches. Like one of the approaches that, once again, we couldn't get to fly but made perfect sense is instead of uh, the data owner at that local command making that decision, why not the personnel owner at my command making that decision, deciding that I had the need to know. Um, we we fast-forwarded a number of years, and we actually were looking at uh, attribute-based access control, uh, to uh, basically categorize the data and then have attributes about the particular user, not just their clearance, but their citizenship, uh, their position, um, the, uh, the particular mission they were assigned to, and put those factors together and allow them to gate access. Once again, we made some really good progress, but uh, we had a couple of senior leaders leave the service, uh, rotate to different jobs, and all of a sudden everything snapped back because... Um, you know, quite frankly, in the Department of Defense, to really affect change, you've got to move uh, budget and people. And uh, if you just, uh, you know, tweak policy in the margins, it always goes back to what it was. Well, the other thing, too, is he who owns the data is the person who classifies the data. And that can sometimes be much more subjective than it actually probably should be. Uh, another thing we brought up, full motion video. You can have a one-hour clip of something of a full motion video feed, and if there's a single activity that takes place that might be an elevated classification, you're going to lose all that entire feed because of that single, you know, that single moment in time. There, there needs to be a better way of being able to possibly clip out those particular sections so that way at least the remainder of the information can be utilized in some other fashion. Right, and right for now some it's just not. other purpose than what it was originally intended for, That's right. but may help with mission right. success. Right, exactly. 
Well, Dave and Angel, thank you very much for your for your, uh, comments here. Quick, quick question about you know as we go to a cloud world, uh, your your ex agency this has become important because of the connectivity issues, right? So right. you can be neither cloud, but it's really important to connect back home. And the projects that I've worked on, a lot of time is spent on you know sort of connecting to that and making sure that the connectivity is in place, all the security is flowing back and forth. How do you how do you see the agency's mission evolving as being the provider itself to sort of a shared services organization to the cloud providers? So I, I think first of all, this is going to have to decide that it wants to move out of becoming that provider and move to the shared services provider, uh, the security oversight, for example. Um, they also have to be able to look dynamically at things that have been put in place. So, for example, a few years ago we came up with this notion of a cloud access point. Believe it or not, that was invented in a conference room by me and an uh, SIS from uh, NSA on my whiteboard. And it took on a life of its own. And unfortunately, the first implementation of it was so god-awful unperformant that it almost uh, you know, sunk all cloud efforts in the Department of Defense. So uh, things have to change. You have to, to move rapidly. Uh, we heard the last speaker talk about moving uh, uh, off of TIC to uh, implement certain security functions as part of the cloud itself. So we've got to be dynamic. Organizations like DISA potentially may need to rethink what it is they're doing in the first place. Um, and instead of owning computing, facilitating the department's computing architecture, for example. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Once again, that was like, it literally, we just came, well, what are we going to call this? How about a cloud access point? We circled it on the whiteboard. I probably have a picture of it somewhere. We have time for one more question. Any? All right. I just wanted to thank our uh, distinguished guests and panel and everybody for participating. Thank you.